Um, who has had difficulties making decisions with, well, let's just call out forms. Like, well, how should this form be structured? How should the user know if they're typing something wrong? When should I validate? And how do I, you know, how's that? Who's had the issue just creating a nice form? Right, you know, all of us, right? <laughs> That's what we're working on right now. <laughs> um, and then who's like found themselves like creating CSS files? And there's nothing wrong with CSS files. They're, 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 they play their role, but let's say you're actually actively developing an application and you're having to write a lot of custom CSS inline style tags. Who's done that? All right, and find that a little bit, you know, challenging. All right, who's written in a component that existed already elsewhere in the code base? All right, and done that. And <laughs> all right, so um, that's the design systems help make all those things occur less frequently. Um, so, and they also um, occur less frequently or make it a little bit easier to, to solve those issues. And so that's the cool part about design systems. So we have design systems have some goals. They decrease production costs customer experience, increase product velocity, increase accessibility, uh, democratize design and sharing innovation, and they help with compliance. So there's all those goals. So how does it do that? So we know now we have these issues. How does it do that? That's where I was trying to figure out and bridge the gap. So um, I, let's start off with looking at so now we have, we have, do you guys all have that idea? That's where we're going. We have a question. Okay, how does the design system help? We know these issues. It's supposed to help with that. How does it do that? Um, let's look at first some design systems. So there's this cool website. I encourage you guys to visit. You can peruse it right now actively as we're going through the talk. It is designsystems.surf. And it's just a database kind of of a lot of popular design systems. So at first glance, when I'm looking at this, I discovered, I was like, oh, well, almost every, well, these are just the most popular ones that people have like curated and put into this little database, but pretty much any product or product ecosystem has a design system. So there's not like, there's like hardly any products out there that do not have a design system. So I'm like, obviously they're, they're pretty cool, they're important. And then that made me realize, okay, some design systems are curated and designed for a specific product because they have specific problems. So it's really cool to look at, well, what are problems that Adobe is trying to solve? And you can go in here and you can kind of see their, their vision and their ideas around their product and how they've created interfaces to, to come up or come up with interfaces and rules around those things. Um, you'll notice as you get, so this is very you know, brief, like what's a design system? So like, here, you'll notice that the sides of the, or the navigation, the categories, and the organization of design systems are very consistent across all design systems. So you'll have common things like patterns, components, content, and foundation. And foundation is a good place to start. You can come in here and you can learn about all these fundamental things that are used throughout their product. And you can look at tools and resources for a lot of these are sometimes these these are for developers or designers and yeah so the usually these design systems exist as cool websites and you can browse and learn from them so we'll dive in now to some of the some of the bigger wait i don't want that want that delve into some of the things that the design system does to help us with the, the, our big question. One of the things it does is it creates, a, they have common vocabulary. So it allows you as a team, if you're working with a design system, to talk the same language about all sorts of things, about sizing, spacing. Um, and as a developer, we're going to be talking a lot about like uh, validation or when to use what component. So those th there's a lot of common vo vocabulary that is established by reading these docs. So it's like a readme, right? Um, and big portion of the, the way that the design system allows for um, consistency is the use of tokens. And so design tokens are, or should I say like designers 
love variables and properties just as much as we love um, like our dependency injection and our variables and properties. Like it's, it's very similar. Design tokens are kind of like the dependency injection of styles and allows uh, everywhere you just use these tokens, they're essentially variables or properties that are globally used. And so it's just a new term, not to overload the term variable. So we call them design tokens. But um, you might be familiar with, if you've ever like worked with like the bootstrap framework, for example, um, the bootstrap toolkit, which is different than a design system. We'll talk about that later, but it has this idea of tokens where you can configure it. And indeed, that's how tokens usually are manifested. Like design tokens, when you're working with between platforms, you have the designers, they're creating the system. They write tokens that they use throughout the system and whatever platform and design software they're using. And then that gets mapped to something else for Android or iOS. And for web, it's going to be CSS properties typically. So that's how you get all these cool things. So you can be like, oh, I want to have elevation of this and I can quickly apply it to my card and I'll get the right elevation. And then um, we have components. So we can talk about components and know exactly what they are in our team. I thought this was really cool. I there's a lot like there. I spent a lot of time just reading and like learning about how these components are used and what their names are because there's all these things that you just use applications day to day and I'm always like wait what's going on why is this here and, and so it's really cool just reading the design system it's right there it tells you why it's used and what it's for and so when you talk with your team you can say like hey we want a card and they'll be like well this is what they meant by a card and you can go delve into that when the card was appropriate to be used you know all that stuff is implied so you get like this common knowledge that you can share and this is just a screenshot from the material design system from google so you got lists side sheets etc you know what your teammate means when they say hey we're going to add a side sheet and then you're like well that doesn't make sense because usually we don't use side sheets for that so just you could have really good conversations and know what you're talking about and then of course they're built with tokens so you can change something and it will be reflected through all the components in the design system and built so um, one of the biggest questions I had about that was, well, how does that work? There, one, they, so someone is, the big question I had was like, okay, I see these components there. They can be done in whatever format the design team's doing. How do they get to actual code? Well, someone, like if you're at Google, they literally have a library and those things are distributed as packages. So someone's working with the designer and designer designs something, then they go ahead and they're like, we need this for Android. So then the an Android team is literally developing the components, following the same thing, getting these values mapped over. And so that then gets pushed out as a package to all the developers. And so there's this continual flow of just design tokens and component changes that just get mapped over. So the developers don't have to think so much about like, oh, I need to go update this thing from this file I saw from a designer. It's only someone else is taking care of that between before. So there's a developer that that depends on how the team is structured. But I was just reading some teams. That's how they do it. Some team is just in charge of implementing the components and then another team's in, in charge of implementing the software. So that made sense to me. I thought it was really cool. Uh, just a lot of CICD going on with with the design system. And then yeah, there's another thing here. I'll, I'll open up. Um, I love the material design. Doc, the docs, they're great. And another thing that was cool about is motion. So you can talk about motion. Look, it's going to give you all the words you need to know about, like what's duration, easing, what's um, you can learn about your transition guidance, how things should be transitioned. And essentially, you can just speak the language of whatever this motion is. So back to that common vocabulary idea. So, all right. Um, any questions about all that stuff? <laughs> Who likes material design? Yeah, I'm I'm a fan. I'm a fan where the direction it's going. All right. So we talked about um, common vocabulary. Um, I found this nice little picture of what a design system is, and it's holistic to the product. So 
for me as a developer, we often are sitting at the kind of in the we're just interacting with components and interactions and layouts. So I see this as kind of a place we're living all quite a bit. And another team or another people, they're they're taking that design system. It's it's incorporating the styles, so the look and feel of the product into everything. So it really makes a cohesive system, and you'll find a lot of language like or in design systems there'll be portions where like here's how you write copy. We use this type of sentence. We don't use these words. We use this. So there's a lot of like all right look and feel, and for the that it's baked in. So that's what kind of makes some of our favorite products tick is you know research and direction and consensus around how things should behave and also with that holistic picture i think like all right where we live as developers often is we're working just with like the pattern library and we're using like some third party pattern library we don't have access to well, google does make their material design available but like a lot of the other ones, for, it's not really developed for web yet. So we might be using things like Vuetify. And so Vuetify is, and it's, they're, they're, they're applying the same principles that are taught in the material design, but it's not part of the same design system in terms of it doesn't benefit from updates to material design. Don't get developed into Vuetify right away, right? Because that's proprietary, the material design stuff for the most part. Um, or not proprietary, but Google's making those calls. Uh, let's accessibility. I thought this was great. You can click on most any design system and you'll get awesome insights into how what their patterns are for accessibility. And you can read through here what their guidelines are, their best practices and brief overviews and each component itself or sub all over accessibility is mentioned. So if you're wondering about accessibility, you can look here and get like instead of spending a bunch of time on getting a you you can get really good opinions and really good research based process and learn from people just by reading the guidelines versus you know having to go watch a YouTube tutorial right <laughs> or whatever like this is where this is where the people who are making the YouTube tutorials they're living in here so all these cool things about patterns content design form fields and then they even hear um oh, i wanted to give a shout out to brent schneider he is part, um thanks to the ux uh, spokane group meetup group they posted this talk and brent um, was kindly to do that and he actually works on the government's design system <laughs> so this is uh the united states government design system like the medicaid web and medicare websites are built with this and so they have a whole thing too and and how this thing gets integrated but they have an accessibility chapter of course and they talk about axe design libraries and i was like oh what's that so you can it's cool you can see here that they're using this tool here to test their accessibility in their product and so we often spend times like researching hey how should we test accessibility well there's in the docs of these the design systems this often includes as to how these teams are doing it um and so this one's cool, does some playwright tests for accessibility. And then they even I saw they have a plugin that allows you to just like use in your developer console to look at your accessibility and it'll give you warnings. So cool stuff in there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Money tips. <laughs> I'm not the one with the experience. Um, but the question was, what, what it was that the 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 actual implementation of the React library is different than the Material Design library uh, from Google. Is that what it's going after? Just kind of because this is like a someone's open source thing. I and, and maybe she'll chat back. I think that's how yeah. I'm understanding it. Can I speak? Can I speak? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we recently downloaded the component library. Yeah. From um, MUI React. Yeah. yeah. And then it was like, oh, cool. Uh, they have this, this file upload component. 
hey dev hmm. team we're working I'm not on sure this about pilot. that one let's because uh, I, I think what the issue is like the, was it the language around it like knowing what components are available i think that was the question yeah it's um, kind of knowing what components are one. i don't have are don't available have the answer right off my top of my head this one I've read. um so and then if anyone has ideas what to we call can them some sort of stuff but um yeah that's a good question well, let's we can continue though with we went through all those fun little things but oh yeah i was talking about beautify so i think i had here uh, like what is beautify well beautify is like an implementation that they've gone ahead and followed the the, the developers of the components have looked at the styling of material design but you'll notice that when you go to configure it and like themes and styles and stuff, well, one, it looks like Material Design 2, so it's different than Material Design 3, where they kind of change like what animations are available and how the color palette looks, and it's a lot more muted, I think, and there's all sorts of cool little changes they made. But uh, you'll look at Beautify, and they have their themes and their names of their properties are completely different than the names of the properties that or the tokens, their design tokens are completely different from that of uh, material design. So it's not a direct translation. I do know though that Google has been working on, I'd have to look it up, but they are working on, see like you can of course use material design for, um, for Android development, but they are also working on it for web. So these are actually web components. It's a whole nother gambit that we could talk about another time, but they're trying to make um, platform agnostic web components. So you can come in here. Let's see if it gets started. Well, the page I wanted that nice page that has all the pictures of the stuff. Well, they have a roadmap where they're rolling out a lot of web components. So basically the same things that look in Android, they're they're recreating JavaScript and CSS ones that are web components. So that means that they are plug and play with other frameworks because they're just JavaScript and they use this new web component library that JavaScript introduced. So you can wrap in CSS and style, so style and logic into a little package that you can just use in your view or react. So that's cool that they're going going there with that. It's pretty complicated though, and it's really hard to write web components. It's not as easy as writing just like a view component or a React component. Mm -hmm. It is it is a it is a you could call it a standard. I'm not familiar enough to like give a description, but what it is is it's a way to write a component, i.e. JavaScript and CSS that has reactive properties and a lot like a control so like an input and so you can create an input that has style and everything and it has a little api so anyone can use it from view or react but it's just native C or vanilla javascript and there is a new library they wrote for it to encompass all this stuff um, for browsers so there's this web component library or uh, api that they created so Going forward, we might get more uh, tra direct translation from Google's design system right into your React. Ho hopefully, they'll work on that. But most of the stuff is planned, and there's just a, there's, I think there's like 15 components that they have completed in the Material Design Web Component Library. So, so yeah, back to Beautify. It is, you know, someone's that they they basically they're trying to create in view material design, and it's just a little different. But that's what we're going to talk about today. In the next step of this, let's make sure I'm following all the things I wanted to go. Mm hmm. Yeah, let's move on. Um, we're going to talk about how to use. A design system. So this is just my experience and I'm looking forward to hearing other people's experiences that I talk. 
with how we can use a design system in what I would call an ad hoc manner. Not we're not we're not part of a product team, and so we don't have access to all these cool packages coming down the line. But we want to we want to make smart decisions with our UI, and that's the core of this talk. Is how can we make better UI just looking at these? So we've learned, of course, that we can um, simply read the docs and learn for ourselves what are these common patterns. And I think that's kind of the direction that I like. I like, I like quite a bit. So. Unfortunately, this is like presuming like so you're working on a, uh, a software solution and you don't have the ideal situation where you have that team that has upfront studied the product. They've studied, they've researched and they have looked into, all right, what things do we need? And they've created a design system or copied a design system, but curated it in such a way. And but we're just stuck with, we're developers, we're tasked to create like a form. Well, let's do our best to create a form. And even in our little developer teams, we can kind of start looking at some design systems and get consensus without the ideal situation where someone is doing that research for us. We can make um, better guesses, I guess I would say. So, and a lot of the uh, software we write is like line of business applications. So in that sense, they're, they're used by a small number of people, you know, like five people who specialize in this one part of some, you know, factory. And so they're clicking those buttons there. We don't have as much uh, sometimes usability breathing down our neck to make sure that we deliver. So in that situation, let's just try to do the best we can, um, even though it's not like ideal that we had that upfront design phase. Um, so we can consult those design systems to make an awesome uh, solution to whatever UI. So I prompted ChatGPT to ask me, or to give me a design challenge. And I was like, hey, give me a design challenge, give me some criteria. And then uh, for demonstration purposes, if you're, I was like, all right, here's how, like, here's one way we can look at design systems and create something with it. So I asked it to, uh, uh, Give me the challenge was for a help desk ticketing system inbox. And I just said, hey, just the inbox of a help desk ticketing system. And it gave me some requests. So I need to have a ticket list display. Um, and that display needs to do the following items. And it needs to filter and sort. So I need some filtering and sorting somewhere in here of all these tickets. I need some customized views. I thought this was cool. I need the um the customer service representative needs to be able to customize the view. So not just filter, it sounds like I need to have, um, what way I understood is like a view that is like a preset for a filter. And, and maybe there's some logic behind that, but I don't have to worry about how that's created. I just know I have views, it looks like. And then I have bulk action capability. So it looks like some multi-select options. And then quick preview and search functionality, and then real-time updates. Really, that's that's like an um, implementation thing, so I'm not worried about that with the design. So we have those criteria. And so the first thing I did was like, all right, what type of information or what type of information is probably going to be on this screen? And so I know I have a list of tickets, so I have like a list of tickets. OK. Um, and then I was like, oh, these customizable views. Well, where, where does that live? So. Um, I consulted the design system, design systems. So I'll just probably bring this as a new tab. I don't have to switch between it. So I consulted design systems. I went to Google and I read all about their um, their layouts. So Google is material design. They have this whole thing about flying layout. I went and they talked about windows size classes um and basically here they'll give you a whole breakdown of when to what things should be shown on compact screens what should be on medium screens and expanded screens and they have all these cool little ideas about where your navigation should go where your body should go and how many panels you should have. They refer to like these main workspaces as panels. And they also 
do cool things in here. Like I, they had animations too on some of the, in the various places in the documentation. Like it showed like, oh, how like on a, on a foldable phone, when you open it up, how it should go from one panel to two panel. Maybe we'll come across it in here. But I was like, oh, that's, that's super cool. <laughs> so I was looking at this and I was like, all right, it kind of prescribed to me um, when I was reading through it, I felt that the design I should go with is two panels. So a main panel for the content of the list. And then because, and I had a screenshot. Anyways, they had a, they had a, they had some tables in here too. Where are the tables at? Yeah, like these tables, you can look right here. You can be like, well, I have a medium display, so I should only have one or two panes, right? You can check off your boxes here. And so you can make, you know, wiser design decisions right here on the table. So did that. And then I consulted another. I was like, okay, what are some similar products to the ticketing system I'm doing? So I know that um is this at this is not Atlassian. Who is the lightning? Lightning design system. Oh, Salesforce. I'm like Salesforce, they do ticketing. I'm gonna go look at their design docs. And they had layout here and they talked about um down here this whole thing oh right here master layouts it's probably a little small right master detail layouts and the layout groups uh explains like here there's a smaller list of items and then there's a preview of the details based on their interactions with clicking so they described to me a behavior and it describes like where these things should go and i was like this is awesome so with that knowledge, I attempted to, you know, first I came up with my generic layout. And then I went ahead and so I got my little, you know, small screen and then I got my medium and large screens here. And then I went ahead and mocked up putting that information on there. So then to figure out like, OK, I had the criteria right of search. I had the criteria of a list. Like, how should those things look? So then I went to a, a design system, right? See the pattern? And I found um, workbenches. So they, their design system had this awesome thing about control layout. And control layout is a pattern to curate data, performing action, searching, filtering. I'm like, that's exactly what I need, right? So I went through here, I looked at their anatomy, and this tells me how kind of they actually have like very specific things of how you know everything should be sitting next to each other and all that stuff. But right now I'm just mocking it up. And for reference, all this these components are from a I think it's called the Proline library. So I'm just copying and pasting components from this asset folder here. So I have all these fun assets to help mock it up faster. Um, yeah. So then I looked at this and it you know tells me. All right, here's how it should be on small screens. Here's how it should be on bigger screens. Great. Like, I don't have to make those decisions. Like, they, they've, they've done this. It makes good sense. And then I was like, oh, well, the big question I had is like, okay, I got my thing here called data grid. So I can mark this up. That looks pretty good for some tickets for me. And then I was like, what, what should it look like on small screens? Well, here you go. They have this thing called data card. So on small screens, the list collapses and you get these little cards. I was like, I think that works well enough here. And so that was my guess for my small screen. I got my small screen here. And then I have, I turned my little sidebar. Yeah. There. Mm hmm. So, yeah. So, thanks. Uh, Reese is asked, like, all right, how do you handle transitions between a small screen to a large screen? Let's say, like, you're thinking like someone's resizing a window. Okay. Um, yeah, the that is definitely a tricky part for a programmer to do. So uh, there is in the material design, they talk about how um, that was presented. They they talk about transitions. I'm trying to think where. Come on. Where is it at? Come on, boy. Maybe they have it under here. 
they had some awesome animations in here. So I'm not sure what page it's on and how to search for it. So let's see, let's see if they, it's in there. Um, bold transition. Maybe on this page. Um, no, they're not seeing the awesome transitions. But that is definitely a challenge to, to program how things, but they do prescribe ways of how using motion to make things appear and fade really helps with that transition of going from bigger to smaller. But for the most part, you know, with web, I mean, this is just an opinion, like with web, if you're resizing the browser, things just kind of pop up, right? Maybe they add a CSS, like as it gets bigger, it fades in or something like that. But exactly, they do prescribe though maybe you're quite maybe this would help is they do prescribe when things should transition as in what pixels how many what should be the width of the viewport at which point does it transition from one to two panes so we did see that in the control layout here here at 400 so it says right here like for example the control layout at 601 pixels and above it should look like this and below that then it should pop over yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the term breakpoints, thanks. So it will tell you when it should transition. Handling those transitions is a little bit trickier. It's built into Android, so they've programmed it. So if you're using their their stuff, as far as I know, because I've done a little bit of Android, is if you're using their components or their, I, forget, I don't even know what they call their layout anymore, but if you're using their, overarching window layouts it'll know how to handle foldable screens for you it'll know, it'll know how to handle um landscape orientation twitches like on a ipad like on a bigger tablet it'll just do it and it'll make it look nice and so the prescribed animate motion that they prescribe is implemented in android so we just don't get that in the web because that's a lot more work <laughs> So we have, is this, is this um, any questions? Does this, does this actually seem effective? Who has experience using a design system in this way other than, other than me? So I don't feel <laughs> you know, does anyone look, look, or read things and applied things like this in their, in their line of work? All right, hopefully I'm not just talking much malarkey here. <laughs> All right, so I have my, Two screens here for the the main ticketing layout, and this is going to look like on small. So look like on big. You know we have our filter over here, and then our filter comes here. And then even then, I was like, all right, I know I have a filter. What should the filter do? Like when I click this button, how should that behave? Well, sure enough, of course, the same workbench by Augusto. They have their workbench design system. Indeed, explains how the filter when it's used and how it works and so it's like all right if your filter is on a control layout you can use it to sort stuff and it's a dialog component for both desktop and mobile but you can make it super big and fill the entire screen on mobile so it tells you that and it tells you that the footer should only have apply and clear all um, options so that's pretty cool. That's what I would think my filter would end up looking like. I can just go after this dialogue. I know it should be a dialogue. I'm not thinking like, oh, is it some sidebar? Is it some what, you know, like you can get tripped up on those things, right? <laughs> At least I do. I'm like, all right, this looks cool. So now they could filter their stuff. And that's what that filter button would do. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then I have over here on this side, I had my views. And so basically my thinking, I'm thinking like they click on the view that refreshes the, the side here and just shows the tickets that follow under that category. I've met my criteria for showing status, assignee and subject. Let's go back here. Um, so we have filtering, sorting options, customizable views, uh, bulk actions with the multi-select option. And, oh yeah, I didn't even tag that. They also have 
this action button is also outlined in the workbench gusto, like how it should behave, what it should do. So I didn't highlight that, but just like how do I do that action button? That that's that's handled. I love that. And then oh, I was like, oh, quick preview and access. I'm like, well, how do I do that? That sounds similar to it sounds like I'm clicking on it and I'm getting a preview of the ticket, but I'm not fully interacting with it. I just want to like I'm you know scrubbing through these things. That's what I'm thinking that that criteria is based on that. And I looked at again that layout, the master de detail layout. Well, they just pop it out to the side. And I'm like, well, I have these views already on the other side. So I don't know. This is I this would take a little bit of um, you know, testing to figure out what was the best thing, best thing for the user. But what I came up with just for initial rough cut was um, I'm gonna have what I looked at uh, in material design, they have a side sheet. And the side sheets coexist with the primary UI region in interaction with both surfaces. So the idea is usually they come in, and you'll see this a lot in Google, like Google Drive, Google, Gmail, all that stuff. It'll come in, and it won't actually overlap the tickets. The tickets will get pushed over. So the tickets will get pushed over. But I thought, I was like, OK, it can float. So I made it actually just float over the top. So that's a little different. But the goal was, if I'm clicking here, then this side sheet opens and just gets refreshed every time I click. Uh, and I think that pattern, it's the idea is you can keep content on the screen and uh, it doesn't affect the other actions or it's contextual actions that are related to the, the what's going on this screen reflects over here. So you can see that in Google Drive, right? If you have your details pane open, that's the sidebar. And their or the side sheet, I should say. See, you gotta have to write terminology. Not a sidebar, side side sheet. They're clicking, they get their details. And so that is what I have going here. And I was like, I needed to, they wanted to be able to do some quick action. So maybe they can change the signee and they can view the recent activity. I just made up some things based on kind of what I thought the requirements were. So that was the that was the beauty of that's where I got and I thought I was like oh this kind of seems like a cool thing and the biggest benefit of this at least in my mind is like I was kind of confident in it because I didn't really have to I didn't do much of the thinking it was just trying to apply the what was already written in the in the documentation because not, not only like this layout here isn't just like one component it's it prescribing to me a way to use multiple components in a cohesive manner and so i really like that i'm not you know i'm not an experienced designer so of course it would be good to get feedback on whatever i'm coming up with but we got something we got somewhere real fast with consulting previous research in the documentation um yeah that that is the i i, I know you have before i close out i know you have experience in, in 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 working with teams and design, um, do you guys have some sort of documentation that you guys share? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you find that, um, what parts of that do you find effective? And do you find any parts of it that are like, well, it's kind of, is it ever a burden? Yeah. That's great. Um, the hard part, I guess, is just having to update it. Like I update, said, yeah. living documents, so updating yeah. it constantly. Yeah. yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah, that's what I discovered. Thanks for sharing the the design system. It's it they're not magic bullets, as in terms of they just live like they're they're part of your product, and I think it's a key thing. Just like you have to get oil changes, you have to or whatever in terms of your whatever maintenance. It's it's a living thing. I like that part, and I just was watching some videos of other other teams and how they do it, and it, they just have to take a really good conscientious effort. So. It's um, yeah, you just gotta accept that, but the rewards are there. 
and that's what I've, I've seen is that it does pay off. Do you get? I, I'm begging. I'm begging the answer here. <laughs> begging the question. But, uh, do you get less questions from your yeah, developers? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's cool. And yeah, what is that process like? Uh, how often? I'd say about five to ten a day. Just like little, like just any little update on the road. But before the ticket goes to key way. Maybe do a design review okay. and before it's the code gets done. So you were really close with your developers, right? So yes. They're constantly asking you, you're constantly yes. giving feedback during yes. the site. So yes. it's not just like we go into a sprint, we go dark. No, oh, yeah. nothing. Exactly. Nothing yeah. Just feedback. So yeah. That is full. Exactly. Mm. Well, yeah, the hard part is off the only first step. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 We need to order. Yeah. Yeah. All right. As as a designer doing that, being the only person, what is some of uh, what are some of the ways that you are learning or gaining more confidence in your decisions? What type of strategies do you have for learning about like that UI realm? There you go. Yeah. Like the rationale. Mm hmm. Have a concrete, like, reason why it's done the way, you know, why you decided to go with this one or with this solution. Yeah. So. That, I like, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's good. Well, that is the end of. What I have to show for everyone, I really appreciate everyone's participation and just coming and supporting uh, my my journey here as I'm av avidly learning about these design solutions. Yeah, do you have a question? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I guess how to make it more frictionless between the language developers speak and the language that designers speak. Yeah. Um, any tips on that? I, I think that's kind of what the question is getting at. Well, my best guess, because based on what we've like, based on all the stuff I just said, and now I'm reflecting, <laughs> uh, is I think just yeah the. And the developers do have to take a little bit of time. This is written for developers and non-developers. I would think that would be helpful if they're reading the design documentation and seeing these things. And then, yeah, those tokens, I mean, that is, if they spend a little bit of time, like it, it, it was a little bit confusing to me, this whole idea of a token and was it, what was special about it. And I quickly just realized, well, it's just CSS properties reflected. So I, 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 as a developer, yes, I was confused for a moment and I maybe don't have the best understanding to like explain how to make that less friction, but by reading about it briefly, so like maybe it would be a training. I don't know, like make it fun, make, make it have, take a set, set time with your team to have that training to do talk about design tokens and what they get translated to. Um, because right here, where they got sources? They didn't show here. But essentially, like in Google, they're, all their tokens, they end up in different ways, but they're part of like the Android material design library and they're accessible in different ways. So learning about how, how are, maybe would be effective is how do developers interact with those tokens and showing them where in the library are these tokens prevalent, prevalent? Where do you find them? Um, I was watching one video. It was it was a company called Knapsack, and they literally just had a 
um, package called knapsack forward slash design tokens. And so the developers were used to using them at that package and that was convenient for them and those tokens so they could create custom components. And yeah, I think maybe it's just a little training. That's my best guess. So. Pardon. That's a good point. So a little bit of a prototype in some way, example. Yes, yes, yes. Good point. So, please. Are the links that you have to be accessible on the front page? Yes, I can make them accessible. Yeah, I'll just post them in Teams. I'm supposed to take my file for everyone. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm glad you found them supportive. And yeah, so still, you can still ask anyone, can still ask questions, but yeah, that's the conclusion is that uh, my conclusion is design is offer awesome documentation for optimal use of your UI elements and requirements with heavy emphasis on research backed usability. And if you consult design systems, you can make informed decisions about your UI and you can use them in an ad hoc pat manner as I demonstrated today. So thank you so much for joining and yeah, enjoy the last few minutes of your lunch. Hope you had learned. I bet you had more lunch than learned, but you know, we know how it goes. So thank you everyone. <laughs>